What's going on, Vikings fans? Welcome to the Vikings Now by Chat Sports. My name is Patrick Seatman. Coming up on today's show, I wanted to go back and look at some of the top winners and losers from this Vikings offseason, as it was one of the most important offseasons in recent Vikings history. A ton of moves were made, so I just kind of want to go back in time and just recap what we saw and which players, you know, took the biggest leap and which players, you know, may have gotten screwed this offseason. But number one, we can start off with the best non-quarterback in the National Football League, and that is Justin Jefferson. And, you know, the biggest reason why he is the winner on this list is he got paid, and he got paid the highest paid non-quarterback in the National Football League. Here are the contract details. You see him right now. He actually did lower his cap hit from $19 million this uh, upcoming season to about 8 dollars 2025, he's going to be making around 15. 26, he'll be making around 40. Then 27, 44 million. And then 2028, he's going to be making 48 million dollars. I really hope the NFL cap keeps on going up for that. You know, cap hit doesn't look, you know, as a, uh, as extreme. But a lot of talk around: Did the Vikings make the right choice? Did or should the Vikings have made him the highest paid non-quarterback? I think 100. percent And you know, you just look at what he's done over his NFL career. You know, we can talk about on the field first. He's been fantastic. In 60 games, he's got the highest yards per game in NFL history. Solid yards per catch at 15. Uh, just under 6,000 yards. And he's just been awesome on the football field. You date back to the season when the Vikings won 13 games, won all those one-score victories. A big reason of that was just late in the game, you had your closer. Like, it had like an NBA feel to the Vikings that season where they just threw the ball up to 18 and he just got up, and he won a lot of those games. And I think Jefferson's the face of the franchise, no doubt about it. Um, you know, I think it was pretty clear after he got extended and just the way he was talking in his press conference after the fact, he just sounded more as the leader. And he even addressed it. He said it. I need to take on that leadership role, especially with Kirk Cousins out of the organization now. Like, it really seems like the Vikings were fully pivoting to 18, being the face and being the guy they are going to build around moving forward. So just credit to Justin Jefferson. I think he deserves every cent. And I think if you had to look at the biggest winner of this offseason, it's definitely number 18. But number two for me, maybe a little bit of a shocker here. I want defensive coordinator Brian Flores, and for a multitude of reasons. I mean, number one, we can talk about free agency. The Vikings loaded up on that side of the football. And, you know, losing Daniel Hunter hurt, no doubt about it. I think he's one of the best edge rushers in the NFL. But how do you replace him? It was like a little Moneyball style where when the, uh, if you guys seen the Moneyball movie where Brad Pitt, he was trying to replace Jason Giambi. And how did they say we have to do it? Well, we just need to get up to a certain amount of home runs and RBIs. Vikings necessarily did the same thing in the edge department. How do we replace Daniel Hunter? Well, we got to get to, you know, 15, 16 sacks. And they did so by bringing in Jonathan Gennard, Andrew Van Ginkle. Loved the addition of Blake Cashman being that linebacker next dive in pace. And then also Shaq Griffin, a good rotational piece in the secondary. And you look at this Vikings defense as a whole right now. I mean, you know, you got 10 pretty elite defensive players. That's why I'm so excited about this year because – I think if you ask the common NFL fan, you know, what do you think of the Minnesota Vikings? Like, you know, I, I just think they're, no, not as high on him. But, I mean, you look at all these guys, Grenard, Van Ginkle, Cashman. You got the three-headed monster at safety and Metellus, Bynum, and Smith. Still got Harrison Phillips, Ivan Pace. Hopefully he takes that, you know, sophomore leap coming off a great freshman or rookie season. And then, you know, Byron Murphy. And then also at pick 17, you took Dallas Turner, who in my opinion was the best scheme fit for what Flores likes to do, and that's what I love what the Vikings did this offseason. They brought in players that perfectly fit with Brian Flores' defensive scheme. What is the buzzword I always say about Flores? Versatility, versatility, versatility. The Vikings have some of the most versatile, you know, defensive personnel, in my opinion, in the league. Like, you know, Andrew Van Ginkle. Think of him, you think of a versatile football player. Josh Metellus, even the draft pick of Dallas Turner, he has ability to drop back in coverage. So I just love the way, you know, the Vikings have seemed like they're on the same page, you know, with the front office and their coaching staff. But, you know, we'll make this point. I think this could be his last season with the Minnesota Vikings. I expect a big-time year from this defense. And if he turns them from being the worst defense in the league a couple years ago under Ed Donatello to one of the best, I could definitely see, you know, if there's a team with a head coaching uh, position open, they're going to be calling Brian Flores right away. But number three for me, I got J.J. McCarthy. And, you know, even though he wasn't a, you know, a Vikings winner technically of the offseason, just, you know, personally for him, like, I think the Vikings were the best landing spot for J.J. Like, I'm sure if J.J. was, you know, choosing, you know, he was looking at all the places he could go, I'm sure Minnesota was high on his list, you know, for many reasons. You can start with the coaching staff. Like, you have Josh McCown, great quarterback coach. Kevin O'Connell, you know, I 
Sometimes I don't like the comparison of calling him the tall Sean McVay. But, you know, he has clearly shown an ability to be one of the top offensive coaches in the league. And then also, you're going to be playing with a plethora of weapons. Like, I think if you showed this graphic for every NFL team where you pick two wide receivers, a running back, a tight end, and an offensive lineman, besides the San Francisco 49ers, I don't think a team can match with what Minnesota has on this side of the football. I think Addison's going to have a massive year, too. We know what Jefferson is, but the addition of Aaron Jones, who's one of the best running backs in the league, from the second half of the season last year. Yes, TJ Hawkinson rehabbing that torn ACL, MCL, but I expect him to be good by hopefully mid-November. And then I think Christian Derisaw, one of the best left tackles in the league. And the you know another reason why I do love this for JJ, you gave him the ability to sit. You know, he did just turn 21 years old in January. This wasn't a situation where you were taking Michael Penix or Jaden Daniels, some of these older quarterback prospects. He has an ability to sit behind Sam Darnold and my bold prediction, when people ask me, oh, how many games do you think Sam Darnold started in this season for the Vikings? I'm going to say 18 games. Vikes go 10-7, and seven, losing the first round of the playoffs all on the back of Sammy D. But number four for me as an offseason winner is Christian Darisol. And, you know, you may be asking yourself, well, why, why is Darisol a winner? Well, you know, some of the recent moves that were made in the NFL this past offseason, I think have Darisol slated to get a big old payday. And we can look at the highest paid left tackles here. Panay Sewell, like him getting $28 million was huge for Darisaw because if he goes out there and he has a monster year this upcoming season, he's going to be saying, I want that $28 million per year marker, especially with just him being in the own division. I think that's, you know, maybe that doesn't matter, but I just think, you know, Darisaw is going to be looking at him, putting that contract down on the table and being like, that's how much I want to make. And then also Ryan Fowler, he had this, he said, Darisaw's likely average per year will land near $28 million. Now, if I was in the Viking side, and, you know, if I was addressing his Darisaw extension, I'm getting him paid right now because I think you could get him for maybe $25 million a year, you know, over the next five seasons if you do that move right now. But let's just say he goes ahead as an all-pro year. I could see Darisaw even asking for, you know, potentially $30 million. So I got Darisaw as my fourth winner this offseason. But number five for me, uh, Byron Murphy, and this is for two reasons. Number one, he looked awesome during minicamp and the OTA period. You know, there was a uh, viral clip of him and Dwight McGlother in the UDFA corner out of Arkansas, they were working after practice. So I like seeing Murphy step up in that leadership role. But I just think the Vikings added a good bunch of good pieces around him in the secondary. Like, I think, you know, the addition of Shaq Griffin, it's not a needle mover. You didn't get a cornerback one by any means. But you got another guy who you can just kind of throw in there where, you know, not all the attention goes on Murphy. And then you're hoping guys like a Caleb Evans, Blackman, Kyrie Jackson, you know, those guys step up and you don't have all the pressure on Murphy, and it gets me this, like, the Vikings took a lot of pressure off him, because I think back to that Chargers game, when Byron Murphy was one-on-one -on -one with Keenan Allen the entire game, and he cooked him for 200-plus yards, like, that's not going to be the situation this year, because the Vikings are going to have a better pass rush, just a better overall defense, not that whole load of, you know, the attention is going to go on Byron Murphy, so I got him as a sneaky winner of this offseason, but you guys let me know, who is the biggest winner of the Vikings offseason? I'll say this, you're not allowed to say Justin Jefferson. Give me a name besides number 18, and let me know who was your biggest winner for the Vikings this offseason. And if you guys want to go get my second winner, of the, or third winner of the offseason, J.J. McCarthy's jersey, hit that link, chatsports.com slash Vikings jersey. I'll have that link for you guys in the comments and description of today's show. I got mine. I got the all-white jersey, my first white Viking jersey I've actually ever owned. So that's the one I went with. But hey, if you guys want to get one as well, hit that link right there, chatsports.com slash Vikings jersey. So I think this one is fairly obvious. And, you know, the biggest loser of this offseason is Lewis Seen. And, again, this is, you know, when I'm talking about losers of the offseason, this is nothing that they directly did. But, you know, I think Lewis Seen is going to be looking, you know, from the outside in on the 53-man roster. And, you know, a big reason of that is just the Vikings' safety room is absolutely loaded. You know, Cam Bynum, Harrison Smith, uh, Josh Metellus, the three-headed monster there. But then you even got guys like Jay Ward, Theo Jackson, who I think are higher up in this depth chart right now than Lewis Seen. Then also, we got a report yesterday they, Yesterday, that special team star, Najee Thompson, is actually going to be working in with the safety. So even if the Vikings keep six safeties, I don't think Lewis Seen cracks that nod. So I think he's going to have a real tough time making this roster. And Pro Football Talk also talked about it where they said this. It just hasn't worked out for Seen in Minnesota. He was barely playing at the start of his rookie season before he suffered a compound fracture in his leg in week four that caused him to miss the rest of the year. In his second season, he only played in seven games, almost exclusively on special teams. But if Seen makes the team, it may be mostly because of his $1.7 salary is guaranteed, and cutting him doesn't save the Vikings 
any salary cap space. So if the Vikings are picking up their best players, though it doesn't look like Scene will be one of the 53. And, you know, I think Scene's going to get cut. I understand the Vikings don't have any, you know, cap savings. Um, you know, they don't really necessarily have a benefit from, you know, cutting Lewis Scene. But, you know, just look at this roster. You look at the safety depth chart. Like, I just really can't see a situation where, you know, even if the Vikings do keep six safeties, like, you're choosing Najee Thompson over him. And I understand you only play special teams, but, you know, my heart kind of goes out for Scene. Like, it's nothing that you know, necessarily he did is he only played 10 defensive snaps so far for the Vikings. So I just think he's going to get cut and it just, you know, you know, stinks for him. But number two for me is another guy that could get cut. And that is Andrew Booth Jr. And, you know, I was saying for scene, it was a lot of, you know, not in him, in his control, but for Booth, it's kind of the other situation where a lot of this is kind of on him. And, you know, he's had opportunities over the last couple of years to step up and be, you know, the face of the Vikings cornerback room and he just hasn't had to happen yet like Makai Blackman he's way ahead of the uh depth chart for uh in comparison to Booth Kale Bevins Shaq Griffin um you know even Kyrie Jackson and Dwight McLaughlin like I'd put them ahead of Andrew Booth so I think he's a prime cut candidate for Minnesota and it's just very disappointing that a second and a first round pick from the same draft class could be cut just three years later for the Vikes but number three for me as you guys see the face up on screen that's Adam Rank uh, probably the biggest Bears homer in NFL media. And I got the NFL media as a loser, and I know this is kind of corny here, but, you know, I just think the media is just sleeping on the Vikings right now. And, you know, if you look at every NFL media member, like when they're making their division rankings or they're just power ranking teams, like pro football talk at the Vikings at 23, you know, if you look at any of these rankings, it has the Vikings finishing dead last in the NFC North. I hear you. NFC North is stacked. The Bears had a great offseason. You're anticipating the Lions and the Packers to be better following your know, great seasons for them last season. I understand that. But I think if you just look at this Vikings team, top to bottom, you talk about offensive weapons, you talk about defensive talent, you talk about coaching staff. Like if they just get okay play from the quarterback position, whether it's Sam Darnold or J.J. McCarthy, the Vikings will be a better team than the Bears and the Packers. I will fully stand on that. If they just get okay play from that quarterback spot, they will have a better season than the Packers and the Bears because if you compare the rest of the 52 people on that roster, the Vikings, in my opinion, have the second best team in the division outside of quarterback. But again, quarterback, it matters so much. So again, maybe it's just me drinking a little purple Kool-Aid, but you know, I fully believe in this Vikings, you know, shocking a lot of people this year. And hey, the bookmakers out west, they got the over-under at six and a half wins. I think it's ludicrous. I think it should be about seven and a half, eight and a half. So if I, you know, I'm definitely going to put some money on this, and I suggest you guys do too. But over under six and a half win for the Vikes next season. You guys let me know your thoughts down below. And if you guys want to give me a follow on Twitter, that's the handle right there, at Pat Seeps. Give me a follow over there, and I'll give you guys a follow back. But see you guys next time. School Vikes.